guys, welcome back to Muscle Car. You are not going to believe what Lou and I found. This is a 1970 Nova with only like 30,000 original miles on it. That comes out to something around 17 miles a week on this fashionable inline 236 cylinder. This is the ultimate old lady car, and you're probably never going to find one like it, but if you want to try, we'll show you what to look for. Hey, can we call this thing Project Blue Hair? <laughs> Whatever you want, man. Whatever you want, Sandy. <laughs> Now this is a find with a lot of potential. It really did belong to a little old lady who drove it 17 miles a week. This was about a $2,200 car back in 1970, and we paid her great granddaughter $7,500 for it. That's more than three times the original price, but it's still some kind of deep. The most obvious area on this car is this little spot of rust, but this is in no way a deal killer. We can fix that pretty easily. And as I looked on, I noticed bodywork in the quarter panel here. Because I could see the sand scratches under the paint, the next thing that really gave it away was the fact that this edge is really inconsistent. It's bulbous and there's a lot of hips and dips and valleys and things in it. And then when I ran my hand behind the quarter, I could feel the dents that the body filler is hiding. Now these are things to search for when you're looking for that perfect project car. And check out this interior. It's like 36 years old and pretty much perfect. Since we're going to leave this thing a sleeper, this is going to save us a lot of work. We're just going to leave it alone. So I'm going to turn it over to Lou, who's going to show you what to look for underneath and on the mechanical side of things. Blue hair. You never want to look at a car at night because you can't see nothing. The other thing, during the day, bring a flashlight with you. You might have to look underneath the dashboard. This way you can see what you're looking at, your potential car. Let's get this thing in the air. You look for structural damage. All this up here looks really good. This car obviously has not been punched in the nose at any time. And if it was, they did a really good repair, but it wasn't. Look for leaks. I mean, there's oil on the oil pants. There's more than likely gonna be oil on the ground, but I mean, it's probably from the valve cover gas. It's all minor stuff. Depending on what direction you wanna go with the car, it's a really sound car. And only a teeny spot of rust on the tow board? That's an easy fix. Obviously, this is some professional exhaust repair work that's been done here. They use the drive shaft to hold the exhaust pipe in place. I kind of like that. It's high tech. This car overall is in great shape. If the only thing you got is some rust in the tow boards, you're doing good for a car that's 30-something years old. Notice how I said 30-something. Women don't like to divulge their age. Get out of there so don't crush us. No. This car may be in good shape, but it is 30 some odd years old. And we got a couple things that we need to take care of. Like this. Now there is no need to replace the whole quarter panel for something like that. You can just go to your local hardware store and get some steel the same thickness and go to town. Ah! All right, the first step's just gonna be to cut the old area out with straight cuts and get rid of the rust. One of the most important steps is to get rid of what caused the rust in the first place. And in this case, it was definitely this foam. Come out. The foam's there for sound dead, but it can also collect moisture. Oh, we'll see you later. <laughs> A present for you. The main goal in grinding like this is to get rid of all the rust. All right, now we got the area free of paint and rust. So we got a good clean starting and stopping point for our new metal. This is regular old 18 gauge mild steel. The first line of defense in keeping those new pieces from rusting is to spray all the bare metal areas with some weld through primer, then you're ready to rock. I'm gonna go ahead and make our patch piece out of three pieces total, because there's a lot of complex shape here, and that's gonna help me to do it a little easier. Okay, see where I still have this tail sticking up? That's where I need that shape to be put in. I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna do that. There you go, good as new. All it took was a couple hours, some hand tools, and a welder. Now, if you have a weekend, you can attack several areas like this on your car and really turn it around. Now, old blue hair here, I'm going to turn it into a sleeper because we all know that there's not enough sleepers left in the world. So I'm going to tear out this 236 cylinder and that power glide, and I'm going to slam in a 364 LS motor with 440 horse with a six speed. Oh, man, it's going to be fun.
Now, for you guys who don't know what a sleeper is, it's the kind of car that looks bone stock on the outside. The interior even looks stock, but it's in the drive line that matters. That's what's going to jump out and bite you in the butt. I'm even going to try and keep these fashionable stock hubcaps. This thing is so original, it came in here with just 33,000 miles on it. That's barely 1,000 miles a year. You've never seen one of these babies before on TV. It's GM's LS364 crate motor, right out of the C6 Corvette. But it's set up to run a carburetor. This baby makes 440 horse right out of the box with a 750 on top. Aluminum block, six bolt mains, nodular iron crank. This one's made to go and it's going in our Nova. This is not a simple drop-in deal. We may have to cut the cross member. We'll probably have to make our own mounts. There's no telling what else we might have to do to this thing. Here you go. Some of you guys are probably wondering why would he take the nose off this car for a simple engine swap. Actually, it's a real good reason. I want you guys to see exactly what it is I got to do. I've got to make engine mounts, I've got to worry about exhaust, who knows, I might even have to make headers. But this way, you guys can see exactly what's going on, there's plenty of room for you to look at it. That's why I did it. I'm thinking about you. While Daniel and Brett are getting that Challenger ready for some primer, I'm going to get this fashionable six-cylinder out. So we get the new motor in. Usually I just put it on jack stands so I can get to the tranny mount and the drive shaft. But the lift is right here, so why not? Now there's a few things I gotta do underneath it here. Pull out the drive shaft, unbolt the tranny cross member, and the mount just makes it easier to get it out. And the exhaust, then I can drop this baby down and start pulling it out. High floor exhaust! Coming up, we'll fire up the hot wrench to get our six-speed LS2 in the Nova. While Brett's priming the Challenger, I'm going to yank out the six-cylinder so we keep everything moving along. Now, you want to be careful around your wiring when you do this. Make sure you disconnect everything before you go ripping it out. Don't just cut wires. You're going to get in trouble. I'm environmentally conscious. And that's not all that's out of this place. We're going to be cutting this frame so this 30-something-year-old dirt's got to go. All right, we got our front end cleaned up. It's grease-free. And I'm going to put that in there. Of course, I'll have to do some modifications, but that's OK. That flex plate's going to come off first, because we're putting a Rockland six-speed in this thing. Oh, that's the way, yeah. Now you're probably wondering, hey, why is that guy not putting a clutch and pressure plate on there? Because I'm test fitting everything. And we know we can't use the old motor mounts because they're just not the right ones. So they're out of there. Yeah! <laughs> so we're going to stab this one in for the first time to see how it fits. And then we're going to get an idea of where we need to cut and what we don't need to cut. These exhaust manifolds are in their way, so they're coming off. And that's just the beginning. Now, when I was test fitting the engine the first time, there'll be many of them, trust me, I noticed that the transmission hits the floor. So I've got to take out the interior, cut out the tranny hump, put it back in to see where I need to set up my cross member where the shift is going to fall. Now I've got to be really careful with this rubber mat because it's an integral part of the whole sleeper look. Before I start cutting up this floor, we're going to pull the Challenger out of the spray booth so the guys can start putting it back together. Now you guys are probably going, there he goes, cutting up a really nice Nova. But you know what? That's OK, because I don't feel bad at all about cutting up a really nice car. Oh, 
What I'll do is I'll save this and maybe raise it up. This might save me some work from having to do another one. Well, now that I've got all this new found floor space, it's time to put the engine in. But you're going to see that after the break. Hey, you guys. Welcome back. Hope you had a good break. I know I did. It's time to test fit this engine one more time. At least one more time, by the way and see what we got to do. We can throw this engine in here a bunch of different ways, but no matter how you do it, the carburetor's got to be level. And this thing's going to be a sleeper, so we got to fit everything under the stock hood. Sometimes you might have to cut the oil pan or the cross member, but this one, it fits oh. and I like it. Tell me I'm good. Just tell me. Go ahead, shake the, shake, say yes. Shake the camera, yeah. There you go. A couple of things popped up. No big deal, though. I can always modify it to fit. But I did get these really cool engine mount plates from S&P. What they do is they push the engine forward a little bit so you can use your stock motor mount and chassis mount for this car, if it had a V8. But this car came with a straight six, so I'm going to modify my own chassis mount, and then I'll be good to go. But something that you need to be aware of is this oil pan down here, S&P makes when it's notched to clear the steering linkage from where the engine sits. But I'm going to raise my engine up an inch and a half so I don't have to do that. And therefore, I won't even have to modify my chassis cross member. It just makes it easier for me. I prefer to do that because I'm impatient and I want to get the car on the road. Something that's really important, you always want to run some anti-seize on your steel bolts when you put them in aluminum because the heat from the engine when you run them out, if you don't have anti-seize, you can gall your threads. So I'm going to measure up one of these top mounts and cut some tubing to fit inside of it. Then once the top mounts are ready, I'll get the engine centered up and make some fashionable frame mounts. These tabs here, there's one on each corner, so they're symmetrical. So you can use those to measure from the engine block to the frame rail to center everything up. I'm going to put a spacer between the engine and the cross member to set the engine right down on it so we can get the hoist out of the way. Then we're going to level everything up. Oh, another surprise. The transmission is hitting all along here in the tranny hump because this transmission is so big, I've actually made a couple swipes with the tin snips, but it wasn't enough. So I got to break out the plasma and get ugly with it. We said this engine was going to be in and out a lot. Well, we weren't lying. So here we go again. Easy. Next week, we'll finish up those motor mounts, give Blue Hair some disc brakes, and show you how to overcome a problem we ran into with our headers. That's it for this week. We'll see you guys next time. Later. This is why we call it Muscle Car. Look at all the cool stuff I get to play with. Now I know most of you guys, like myself, have a really hard time finishing one project before you start another, and that's okay. But today, we're going to finish stuffing this LS2 into this 70 Nova that I'm affectionately calling Old Blue Hair. We found this car literally right around the corner, and boy, what a score. This Nova was a one-owner car that was driven 17 miles a week to the grocery store, the beauty shop, and I'm not really sure what she did on Sundays. Yeah, a little old lady, hence the name Old Blue Hair. Now you resto guys will be happy to know that I'm saving the parts on this thing just in case we want to put it back to stock. Project Blue Hair is going to start its new life as a sleeper. It's going to look exactly like it was when we found it. It's going to have the same paint. It's going to have the same stamp. It's even going to have hubcaps. But something different, this LS2 we're slamming in it. Now we just got it level, and we started the engine mounts. And I had to cut a small piece of the floor out. Oh! Why? Because I've got to make room for this massive six-piece so I can get this baby going down the road. 
I don't think Granny would have liked it too much. Next thing I'm gonna do, being that I've got the transmission and engine where I want it, I'm gonna put some bracing in so I can get it up in the air and build a cross member. That tranny's much longer than the original, so I'm cutting up this junkyard piece into three sections. That way, I can take advantage of my original mounting points, then all I have to do is connect the dots. <laughs> now, I was tempted to show off and Fab went out of some stock, but this is much easier to do. Time to yank out the engine so as I can finish up the engine mount. And now I'm going to address this 36-year-old suspension. I'm going to use these 120 wall DOM tubular upper and lower control arms from Detroit Speed and Engineering. The thing that's really cool about these is that stainless steel cross shaft because they actually use slugs so you can really dial in your suspension. So if you want to change it around and get that maximum road race ability, you can get it. And the thing that's cool about these lower control arms is these Delron bushings and inside they've got transfer slots so all the grease gets throughout the whole surface of the bushing. Really high tech stuff. That's some nice stuff. The brakes is next. Now we've been accused of using only high dollar brake kits. Well that's all about to change. Check this out. For $850 you can go to Master Power Brakes and get this complete disc brake conversion. You get the spindles. You get the calipers, you get the brackets, you get the rotors, you get the dust shield, you get all the related hardware, you even get a brake booster and a master cylinder. Now that's a complete kit. Every part is stock, either new or rebuilt. Only the spindles are modified slightly to accept the larger caliper bracket. We're reusing our tie rod ends because they're still good. Remember, no one ships their bearings packed. That part's up to you. Keep in mind, this is a budget disc brake conversion. So these rotors, they're not drilled and slotted. They're not 14 inch, but they're more than enough for our sleeper project. So far, everything's going together real nice. Nobody likes surprises. Just when you think it can't get any better, it does. They give you a proportioning valve, the bracket to mount it. They even give you the fitting for the back of the intake manifold and a hose. But I'm going to hold off on installing all of that because I want to make sure when I put the engine back in, I'm not reaching over everything to get the headers on and I got plenty of room. But you're going to see that later on in the show. Next on Muscle Car, big engine in a small car, but Lou's gonna make it all fit. Welcome back to the shop. I've got my brakes in place, my suspension on. We've even got the LS2 motor stabbed into place where it belongs. Now, there's a few header companies that make headers for this application. But being that I got impatient and made my own engine mounts, I have encountered a small problem. My headers don't fit. That's okay. I've got a solution. And here it is. A lot of your header companies will sell you just the flanges so you can build your own headers. We got ours from Hooker, and they like to use 3 8 mild steel, and it gives you a nice sealing surface and prevents warpage. But this is only to start. Now they sell weld up kits, but I prefer to get all my own stuff. But when you do that, you got to make sure that you order everything you need, like collectors, reducers. If you're going to run O2 sensors, you got to have it. I prefer these J bends because you've got the 180 degree bend. So whatever angle you need, all you got to do is cut it. I'm going to start by putting a quarter inch washer between the flange and the block. And the reason why you do that is you want the header tube to fit flush against the block. I'm starting in the rear hugging the engine as much as possible. Remember, no matter what tool you use, the squarer the cut, the easier to work with. Now underneath, I like to take a piece of tubing so I can get a visual on where everything's gonna go. 
and then I'll tack the collector in place so I know where each tube needs to fall. It's a simple matter of visualizing where you want the tubes to go and then how to get them there. I'm using these alignment rings. The thing that's really neat about them is that they provide nice smooth flow on the inside. This way if you have a gap, you don't have a bunch of wire in there. And they'll hold your tubing up. I'm just tacking everything in place for now because we might have to make some changes. I hope not, but I might. You're probably wondering why I've got these tubes going all over the place. There's a few good reasons. You want to be able to access your spark plugs. You want to be able to clear your steering box. And most of all, you want to try and get it where you can get these headers out of the car without having to take the engine out. And I'm going to run this one straight down here and it'll clear everything. I like it. You gotta be careful not to break any of the tacks. Oh yeah, there it is, there it is. <laughs> Another successful job. You need to take everything off the flange so you're able to weld up your tube. I prefer to use a TIG welder. It's easier to control so there's less chance of burning a hole. Now at this point, you might be tempted to take all your tubes and weld them to the flange, but you don't want to do that. I got something to show you after the break. Hey, we're back on our custom headers for Project Blue Hair. You know, we started out with a couple of flanges and a bunch of J-bends, then we cut them up. We tacked them up to fit, then we disassemble them to weld up the tubing. Now you don't want to weld your headers up on the table over there because the heat could distort your tubing. So what I did was I mounted my flanges back on the engine and now I'm test fitting everything. If they fit your collector and they still mount flush with your heads, you can take them out and weld them up. Check it out, we're almost home. Now make sure your welds come up above the flange so you have enough to surface. So far, the tools needed for this header build, you probably have in your garage. But for this step, you gotta use a belt sander. It's worth a trip to the machine shop to get this done right. Well, there you go. A bunch of J-Bends and a whole lot of time. You can build yourself a set of headers. If I had more time, I'd fill all this in and make them nice and purdy. Now, on the passenger side, we had a header that almost fit, and we got lucky. So we cut it right here, and we fabricated the bottom half. Time to finish the brakes. If you remember, I had to wait till I got my headers in to install this. And that was because I needed to make sure I had enough clearance, which I do. If you feel it's too close, you can always make a heat shield. This massive power brake kit came with a proportioning valve. Even though this Nova didn't have one, this hookup's pretty simple. Man, I am loving this project. Old Blue Hair got a massive shot of Geritol, put some new suspension on it, new brakes, all that to try and slow down a six-speed that's being spun by an LS2 that's making 440 horse and it's carbureted. Now hooking this monster up is going to take some really neat stuff, like the ignition for example. It not only hooks into all the stock sensors, but it's run by, for lack of a better terms, a processor. Now that is cool, but you know what? That's a whole nother show. But I do have time to put this thing together because I'm dying to see what it looks like. Bingo. Well, the old Nova looks like a little old lady would still be driving it. And that's the look we were going for. But there's still some issues that need to be dealt with. Like the rear end. I'm thinking maybe a nine inch just because you got plenty of gear selections but the amount of fabrication it would take to put one of those in, it'd be a lot. 
I could go with a 12 volt because that's what they came with from the factory. Not only that, it'll take the abuse I'm getting ready to throw at it. Now these 14.6s, they're not going to give me the traction that I need. So I decided to go with a 17 inch steel wheel and I get to keep the hubcaps. I need you guys to do me a favor. Send me some emails. I want to know what you think of it, how you would do it, and even what you would change on this project. But there's one thing I'm not changing my mind on. Something no sleeper should be without. Old lady curve feelings. And all is right with the world. Later. Hey, welcome to Muscle Car. Like the sign back there says, we're all about a generation of badass cars. Like our sleeper project here. It looks like a grandma's car, and actually, it was till we got a hold of it. Now, we've hid all the power and muscle out of sight on this baby, and that's why they call it a sleeper. But I've got a lot of work to do today, so I'm going to show you what we've already done. Blue hair came in here bone stock, and I mean bone stock. Six cylinder, two speed power glide, and only 33,000 miles on her. A perfect starting point for a sleeper. Granny car on the outside, street car underneath. The first thing we did was pull off that front clip and stuffed an LS364 crate motor in there. Behind that, we put a Rockland six speed, a T56. Everything's sitting nice and low to clear the stock hood. I had to fab up some custom headers. And all that started with some flanges from hooking. And to make room for that transmission, it required a little bit of internal fabrication. Oh! Which will continue in the next few weeks. Up front, some Detroit Speed control arms and a disc brake conversion for massive power brakes. Then the sheet metal went back on. Think of it as a subtle yet effective disguise. Now we could have used just about any GM small block, but we decided to go with this fourth generation LS2 Stroker, which is really cool because it's basically the same engine you'd find in a new C6 vet. This thing's 364 cubic inches, making 440 horse right out of the crate. The LS2 is a direct descendant of the most popular hot rod engine ever. The new Turbo Fire V8 engine. The classic small block Chevrolet. More than 90 million made and still in production today. Second generation in 1992, the LT1. Not the same engine that went into Camaros and Vets in 1970, but that is where they got the name. Higher compression, better cooling, a little stronger, but still a cast iron block. Serious changes came along with the third generation LS1 in 97. A six bolt aluminum block, a longer stroke for more torque, individual coils for each cylinder, and a different firing order. And the fourth generation, the one we're using, is so advanced, GM set up a new engine plant just to build it. Higher compression and special shaped combustion chambers are just two of the reasons the LS2 small block pulls more than 400 horsepower dead stock. Here in the shop, I'm gonna respect the old school methods. I'm gonna run this 750 Mighty Demon from Barry Grant. It's the perfect mix of 60s muscle and 21st century technology. And that can get complicated. The LS364 has electronic ignition with no distributor. The engine computer picks up pulses from a reluctant wheel on the crankshaft and uses that information to control the spark. But the wheel is different in the new LSs. More teeth for more pulses and better signal to the computer. With that in mind, you've got two options. You can tear apart your brand new crate engine and put a 24 tooth reluctant ring on it, or you can buy an aftermarket ignition setup like this one from Fast, and it'll talk to your 58 tooth reluctant ring. Now we got the very first one, or close to it. Fast built us this special prototype just for this project. To avoid the engine heat, I'm mounting it on the tow board, which I'll box in later. There are only four connections to make, including the all-important reluctor sensor. Well, we're real close to firing this thing up and completely overpowering Granny's old ride. Nothing some frame connectors can't fix, and you'll see that after the break.
Welcome back to the shop. We're going to wake up our sleeper today. We're going to fire up this crate engine. Now, this thing makes over 400 foot-pounds of torque. That's way more twist than this old body can stand. So I'm going to put in some subframe connectors, and I like to do mine on jack stands. Let me tell you why. Those second-generation Novas were unibody cars. They had front and rear subframes. Our crate mode is strong enough to twist that way out of shape. And on top of that, this old body sags a little. So we're going to get it up on jack stands and let the weight of the engine reverse that bend. Then we'll connect the front and rear subframes together with some tubing. Then we're going to tie the connectors to the rocker panels for some extra support. It all starts with clearing out the floor. This is not demolition because it's all going to go back in later. Underneath, with a two-inch wide template, I can locate where the connector will go and then transfer those markings up through the floor. And the reason why I did this is because I'll take my template and line up my holes and then I mark it and when I remove it, I know exactly what to cut out because I'm going to weld the floor to the frame connector. It's neater and it's stronger because it ties everything together. I'm using 2x2 two two 065 wall tubing. That's more than enough for this project. The rear of the connector is going to get notched to clear the brake line and the gas line, then box to give it strength. The front gets an angle cut to butt up against the subframe. I'll box it in, leaving access to the body mount. And use plates to secure the rear. And with one inch square tubing, Tie them to the rocker panel. I guarantee this new backbone straightened out old blue hair. I can see the difference that these connectors made on the car. They're subtle, yet they're apparent. Before, this gap used to be tighter because the car was sagging. Now it's further apart because the sag is gone and the car is straight. And look at this. Even the door gap is tighter and the door closes better. Now, something you got to realize, any car this old is going to have sag in it, and it's going to contribute to wind noise, rattling, and even poor handling. So whether you're doing a full-blown resto or a hot rod, you may want to consider some frame connectors. I put a notch in my frame connector to hold this garden hose that's masquerading as a Dash 8 fuel line, because this engine's going to suck a lot of fuel, and to move all that fuel, I've got this Barry Grant Mighty Enduro pump. The thing that's neat about it is totally rebuildable, and it's got an 8 micron filter in it, but I've encountered a slight problem. It's too big to mount under the car. Too big to hide anyway. So to keep with that original sleeper profile, I'm putting it right here in the trunk, right next to the original spare tire. This thing pushes a lot of fuel at 18 PSI, but we only need 7 and 9 at wide open throttle. Now, we're not just going to choke this down with the regulators. What we're going to do is go beyond that. We're going to run a loop system, which is found on most of your modern day EFI setups. And here's why. This is the traditional way to run a fuel system. A tank, a pump, a regulator. Fuel goes in the carb and gets burned. It's pretty simple, but pressure builds up in the fuel line, so the system can back up and make the pump run hot. With the three-port bypass regulator, excess fuel is returned back to the tank by a return line. So fuel is constantly flowing through the electric pump at all times. The gas is always circulating. No built-up pressure in the system. Everything stays cool. And I'm also going to install this heat sink. It acts like a small radiator and it cools the fuel as it goes through. So I'm going to put it up here for maximum airflow. This system means we run two lines, a feed, and a return. The original tank wasn't set up for a return line, and it's trash anyway. So I got this OEM replacement from Classic Industries. It's a direct reproduction of an original, so it doesn't have a return line either. But I can fix that. The last thing I want to do is have metal shavings in my new gas tank. By putting Vaseline on my Unibit, it'll catch most of the shavings. And then I'll do the same to my screwdriver and clean up any that fell in the tank. Ooh, look at that. Oh, that's a big one. I'm using a Dash 8 bulkhead fitting for the return. And I drilled out the original pickup fitting wide enough for more Dash 8 line. And to keep all this hidden, it's mounted on the top of the tank, which will take up a little bit of trunk room. 
Now, when we get back from the break, I'm gonna finish plumbing up the fuel system, button up underneath the hood, and then we're gonna see if we can get a heartbeat from old blue hair. Welcome back to the shop. I'm running out of time and I'm determined to turn the key on Project Blue Hair. In case you just got here, here's what you missed. I added frame connectors to the unibody to pull the sag out and keep the engine torque from twisting the body. I started a loop fuel system that'll cool the fuel and keep the pressure steady, just like an EFI setup, but it's also great for a carbureted engine. And now it's time to finish up our fuel system under the hood, starting with this bypass regulator. Fuel's gonna come in from the tank. When it leaves, it's gonna go to the carburetor at seven and nine PSI. And the excess fuel's gonna come out this port, going back to the tank. That's why they call it a loop. And it's really cool because it protects the system from overpressurizing. And I protected the pump from any power surges by feeding it through this distribution block with a 50 amp fuse right here next to the battery. A little weight in the rear end never hurt anybody. I even installed an on off switch underneath the dash for our fuel pump, just in case. Now, I called the guys over at Detroit Speed and Engineering and had them whip me up this custom serpentine setup. It's a prototype, but it will be available on their website real soon. Now, this is a non-AC unit because our Nova was non-AC, and I'd rather keep it that way so I can have the extra ponies. This kit starts with a Stewart high flow water pump, which relocates the thermostat housing to the top for better clearance. All the pulleys are CNC machined from lightweight 6160 aluminum. It also came with a PowerMast 140 amp alternator. And the steering pump is a new GM design that's been revalved for better driving response. I gotta tell you, for a prototype, they nailed it. Newer engines of today, like ours, are designed to run about 20 degrees hotter than they did in the past. It makes for better emissions and better fuel consumption, so an aluminum radiator is better suited to dissipate that heat. AFCO sent us their direct replacement radiator with an electric fan and shroud built in. But to keep our sleeper disguised, I painted the front black. All that remains are the hoses, the coolant, and finish up the wiring. I've already filled our gas tank up, and because our LS2 has got 10 to 1 compression, this baby's only gonna drink 93 octane. So let's check the fuel system and see if we got any leaks. I'm gonna roughly dial in my fuel pressure to 8 psi. This way, when it's running, I can really dial it in. Fire it up. How's that for a heart transplant? Now, if you remember, this fast unit is a non-adjustable prototype. They are working on one that you can tune. I still can dial in the carburetor, though. Next week, I'm playing with the rear end, and I got a surprise on the exhaust. Later. Today on Muscle Car, Lou shows you how to make a set of old-fashioned super stock springs perfect for any sleeper project, along with a beefed-up rear end and some creative exhaust suitable for old blue hair's temper. Welcome to the shop. Last week, we woke up our sleeper project. This week, we're going to get her on her feet. We're running a GM LS364 crate engine in this original 70 Nova. Last week, we put in a gas tank, fuel pump, ran the lines, wired the ignition, and stiffened up the frame to handle the extra horsepower. Then, we started her up. Now, our LS makes 440 horse, and that's not gonna stand up to the abuse we're gonna put it to. We do, however, have some options. Most guys would just put a nine inch Ford in this thing and go about their business, but that's gonna ruin our sleeper look. I'm gonna use this original GM 10 bolt, except I'm gonna put better gears and better axles in it. I also wanna convert the Nova from monoleaf to multi-leaf. Now this junkyard rear end is exactly like the one that came out of our Nova, except it has correct purchase for multi-leaf.
This rear end is commonly referred to as an 8.2 because of the size ring gear that it is. Now, a lot of guys really like the 8.5 because it's a larger ring gear, there's more gear selections and better axle selections. The only downside is they're becoming harder to find, which means they're getting to be more expensive. Here's a tip for you when you're shopping at the junkyard. See how this cover has a ridge? This is an 8.2. An 8.5 is smooth like this one here. The 8.2 is perfect for what we want to do. We're going to use this Eaton Limited Slip Differential. The Posi Performance comes with carbon fiber disc. You can get it for 17 or 28 spline axles. We went with 28 because it's stronger. Our ring and pinion are street gears from Richmond. They make everything from a 308 to a 513 for this rear end. We're using a 411. That'll give us great jump off the line. Now for you younger guys, let me tell you what all those numbers mean. There's probably more stress on the ring and pinion than anything else in the car because this is where all the engine's power takes a right-hand turn. Our 411 means the pinion gear has to turn just over four times to make the ring gear go around once. Great for fast starts and spinning those tires, but not good for cruising because the engine's running at a higher RPM. With a higher gear like a 308, the engine's running at a lower RPM, so it's better on gas, but slower off the line. Like love, life and muscle cars, there's a downside to everything. You've got this higher gear, which has more teeth, so it has more contact area with the ring gear. Unlike this lower gear, which is smaller, and it has less teeth, so it's going to have less contact area, and it's going to suffer more abuse. That's why I'm going with this 411. It's a good compromise, and if it breaks, it was worth it. Rebuilding a rear end is not that difficult. However, there's a lot of specs for torques and clearances you need to pay attention to. Your ring set will include all that information. If you screw this up, the cloud behind your car won't be from your tires. Before I go any further, I gotta make some room for some new parts. I like to spray my brakes down before I tear it apart. It keeps the dust down. A few weeks ago, you saw me do a disc brake conversion on the front of this thing. Being at the front does the bulk of the stopping, I decided to go with stock drums in the back. I've seen this mistake before. Primary shoe, secondary shoe. You always want to have your primary shoe going towards the front of the vehicle. Now you know. Alright, I needed some axles that weren't going to break. So I called Summit and they sent me a pair of these Superior axles, the Evolution Series, and they're made of high quality steel. Check it out. The splines are rolled and pressed during the forging process, making them 35% stronger than stock, so they're tough. Now, cut axle splines are machined after the steel cools, so they won't be as strong as what I've got right here. We changed our 8.2 from a 308 to a 411 with a posi and put some seriously tough axles in it. When we get back from the break, we're going to give Granny's sneakers some serious traction. Welcome back. We updated our rear rim with new gears, posi unit, axles, and drum brakes. Now it's time to address the suspension. This monoleaf is old and outdated, and it's not going to work for the abuse we're going to put it through, so it's out of there. We have a few different ways we can fix this. We can mini tub it, we can put a three link in it, or a four link, or even ladder bar it. But those mods are really hard to hide, and I don't want to cut up old blue hair that much. Back in the day, the big yellow traction bars were the norm. They were great for keeping the axle where it was supposed to be. When you're nailing it, the rear end wants to twist upwards, and Mopar racers back in the 60s had the most problems with that. So they came up with a solution. A super stock spring. When power is transferred to the rear end, the pinion tries to rotate upwards, putting more stress on the front of the springs. Our stock monoleaf was not designed to handle this kind of abuse, so the tire spins. Not what we want. On the other hand, super stock springs have more leafs up front, which means more tension. This forces the tires back to the ground so they can hook up. This is a stock replacement spring for a second generation Nova, but it's going to need a slight modification. Remember those super stock springs I told you about 
I'm gonna show you how to make a pair. Be careful when you're taking these packs apart. They need to be clamped so they won't fly apart when you're pulling off the hardware. I'm gonna cut this center pin here, but I'm gonna leave these two C-clamps in place just for safety. Remember, we're not cutting on the front, only on the rear of the leaves, so I'll mark them to avoid any screw-ups. I'm basically creating a short stagger. This Nova only needs a two-inch cut. That'll take out all the resistance from the rear of the leaves. If you don't have a cold saw for this, a chop saw or a cutoff wheel will do the trick. Now, I've got a slight problem. I got a pretty big gap from end to end. I can fix that. What you can do is go wander around the junkyard, or you can find a leaf spring around your shop and use it. Again, a two-inch stagger is all I want. Once they're cut, I'll round them off with a grinder and create a bevel to help them slide better. It's about time to slam these babies back together, but I've encountered a slight problem. My new center pin is larger than my old one, but that's okay. Now you can bore these out if you take your time with a good drill, but I ain't got time. Fire. <laughs> Fire! We're finally ready to put these together, starting with the slider pads. Then compress the leaves with C-clamps and put in the center pins. These factory-style clamps will allow the leaves to slide, but it won't allow them to come apart. It's not required, but I'm tacking them anyway, because we plan to push these babies to the limit. And that's how you make your own super stock springs. Less tension in the rear, more up front. You Mopar guys, you can go out and buy some. You Ford and Chevy guys, you gotta make your own. But now, you know how. With new bushings in the rear, and also on the springs, they can be installed with the original hardware. I've got one more thing to help these super stock springs do their job. This little pinion snubber is adjustable, and it helps limit the rotation of the rear end, so it gets all the power it needs to go, the ground. Once I have the rear end in position, I can connect the back of my springs with new shackles, then introduce our beefed up 8.2 to its new companion, and we'll keep it all together with new U-bolts and brackets from Classic Industries. This is what we started out with. This is what we got. Who says size doesn't matter? Now the last piece of this puzzle are these competition engineering three-way adjustable drag shocks. Now I've encountered a slight problem being that I'm running a bigger tire. My stock shock location was on the outside of the leaf spring. I'm changing that, moving it to the inside, and that'll give me the clearance that I need. Using eighth inch steel, I'll mount these brackets against the frame. They'll help distribute all that force we're gonna put on it. I'm tacking in steel tubing as a cross member to mount the shocks to. Then after figuring out where they need to be connected, I'll weld in a bolt. Well, it may seem like a lot of work to run bigger tires, but it's all worth it, I assure you. Later on in the show, I'm gonna show you how to convert your exhaust system to go in and out of stealth mode. Welcome back. I've only got a few minutes left to finish up this exhaust. Now I really want to scare the hell out of my competition before I blow their doors off. So I put in these Y pipes for some old school cutouts. But I'm going to teach an old dog new tricks. Now back in the day, you would have to manually undo the pipe covers. That would allow the exhaust to come straight out of the headers. But I've got an even better way. And here it is. I got these electric cutouts from DMH Performance. The flip of a switch, this butterfly opens up, and you've got open exhaust. Now, they're made out of aircraft-grade aluminum, and you can get them anywhere between two and four inch diameter. What's cool about these is you can put them on your existing exhaust with little or no modifications. Now, check this out. This switch will get mounted underneath the dash. Be afraid. Be very afraid. 
<laughs> Since we're hiding these underneath, I'm making some short turndowns to avoid cooking the floor. No, I'm not huffing fumes. I'm using this aluminum tubing to mimic my three inch drive shaft that I've got on order. Cause I'm using two and a half inch exhaust. I've got to make sure that I've got enough clearance to put it all in. And this is doable. Now I'm gonna finish these off with some cherry bombs. Now you older guys will remember that classic round tubular glass pack. Well, they're still available, but times have changed. They also came out with an entire line of performance mufflers for every application. These are the new Vortex series. Since the exhaust goes through the middle, these Vortex series mufflers are reversible. That means they can be installed any way you want. I'm taking extra care to keep these pipes close to the body because we don't want anybody to see the bigger exhaust. I got one more thing to fool that unsuspecting victim, a little bit of street camouflage. We did a lot of stuff this week, but this is by far the coolest. Next week, we're gonna button this baby up and then we're gonna see what trouble we can get into. Later. Welcome to Muscle Car. We're about ready to go out and find a victim for old blue hair to abuse. But before we do that, I gotta tell you where we've been. In the last few weeks, we wired up that carbureted GM LS364 to a computerized controller from FAST, created a loop fuel system to avoid unwanted pressure buildup, beefed up the rear end with an Eaton Posit unit, 411 street gears from Richmond, and carbon steel axles from Superior. We threw out the mono leaves and made some Mopar style super stock rear springs. We started with stock replacement leaf springs, shortened some of the leaves and added another one so this spring pack won't twist when we're trying to hook up. We finished up the cooling system and put a serpentine setup from Detroit Speed and Engineering, then crossed our fingers and fired it up. Just for fun, we installed some electric cutouts to hide old blue hair's temper, which we plan to unleash this week. We got a lot of work to do this week. We got to finish the drive line, put in a transmission tunnel, then tighten up the interior. But first, we got to put in a clutch. We're running a Rockland T56 six speed. You see a lot of these in some hot street cars. We put it in without a clutch or a pressure plate just to mock everything up. We pulled out the transmission for the last time so we can finish it. And it all starts with a good flywheel. Now, a lot of guys would use aluminum, but I'm going with steel because I'm gonna abuse the hell out of it. The factory put in an 11 inch flywheel, but I'm throwing in a 12 inch upgrade that'll give me more contact area. And if you scar it up, you can always have it resurfaced. Be sure to remove your pore prints. Use brake parts cleaner. It doesn't leave an oily film like carburetor cleaner does. McLeod hooked me up with this LS Series 100 clutch. Unlike most clutches which are made out of semi-metallic material, this one's made out of organic fibers. That means it won't throw me around between shifts, and it has all the performance of a racing clutch, but with a softer edge. This diaphragm-style pressure plate is perfect for street and track applications. This will give me more leverage, making it easier when I push in the clutch without affecting the clamping load. If your clutch and pressure plate come bolted together, it's more than likely balanced. So what I did was I marked it so I can put it back together the way it came apart. Well, my drive shaft isn't in yet, so I'm pretty much done underneath for right now. But if you guys remember, this thing was an automatic and I'm making it a stick. So I got some other work to do. We got this hydraulic clutch set up from Keesler. Comes with everything you need, including the reservoir. But the toughest thing to put in is the pedals, so they're going in first. It's really not that complicated. It's just hard to get to. These new pedals simply use the factory brake pedal mount. All I have to do is drill the holes and attach the slave cylinder to the firewall. Mount the fluid reservoir. Run hoses. 
and connect the clutch pedal to the slave cylinder rod. The last piece of business is the hydraulic line from the slave cylinder to the trans. Then fill the reservoir and bleed it. I'll let gravity do the work for me. The automatic to manual conversion can be a real pain in the butt. Everything from fabbing your linkage to adjusting your clutch. But with the hydraulic setup, there's far less hardware and there's almost no adjustment. Now some of you guys at the head of the class may have realized I put this wicked clutch in my stock bell housing. A lot of you guys must be doing a similar setup because my scatter shield's on back order. So I'm temporarily using this trans blanket from RCI to keep from playing Catch the Flywheel. And now it's finally time to get rid of the fast Freddy hole in the floor. It's time for some fabrication. Shoving this massive engine and trans in here was like putting a wetsuit on Barney. You know, that purple dinosaur. So I had to get rid of a few acres of flooring. I even had to remove a section of floor bracing to make way for the elevated drive shaft. So starting with some 1 8 thick steel, I'm making a box arch. This will give back the needed support and be a platform for the tin work. Ooh, that steel's hot. Don't get And now I can get started on the tunnel. 18 gauge gives me the strength I need, and it's flexible enough to bend it the way I want. If you don't have a slip roller like this one, use your imagination. I've made plenty of beautiful rolls with an oxygen bottle and a piece of wood. Since this tunnel welds to the floor pan, this one's got to go. I'm bead rolling the replacement with just a little extra strength. You guys get the gist of what's going on here. While you take a break, I'm going to keep working on the floor. And when you get back, we'll see how good the seat fits. Welcome back to the last day of our sleeper project. Here's what we did earlier. We put in a hefty clutch setup from a cloud and started a transmission tunnel from the floor. And while you were gone, we finished it off. This tunnel looks really good if I do say so myself, although I think it's a tad too tall for my bench seat. As a matter of fact, it's about 10 inches too tall. Now, I could go to the junkyard and get some bucket seats, but I really want to keep that sleeper look on the inside. So I'm going to try a little experiment. I'm using some shop trash to make a jig so I can bend the front center support. Voila! Now I'll flip it over and cut out a section of the seat frame. Yeah. Then I cut the spring frame so I can bring them up a little higher. Now remember, there's no guarantees. This is an experiment. Who said you cannot make a bench seat fit with a 10 inch transmission tunnel? <laughs> with some hog rings, I'll tie a few things together. Now if the vinyl will stretch over this, we got it made. I'm gonna let Brent wrestle with that. I've gotta get on that old steering column because it's got that old automatic shift lever. This replacement from I did it doesn't. It's a direct fit with factory plugs for the wiring. You can get these in polished aluminum, but black serves our purpose. So does the stock steering wheel. One last thing to wire up and disguise. Need I say any more? I'm about ready to finish off the interior, but before I cover all this tin work, I gotta seal it to keep the moisture out. The guys at Auto Body Color and Supply set us up with some 3M seam sealer. This stuff dries fast and lasts forever. If you remember, I mounted our fast controller on the tow board. So I made a box to keep it safe and out of sight. A little rattle can paint to seal the rest. I saved this old flooring hoping to reuse it, but that's not gonna cover that three-story transmission tunnel. I could have ordered carpet, but that'd be too easy. 
I wanted to keep the stock looking floor in the car, so I decided to call Auto Custom Carpets. They've been in the game for over 25 years and they're the largest supplier of automotive carpeting. And I knew they would have what I needed to do my floor. We'll start by gluing in the supplied padding to reduce the noise and the heat. Then it's just a simple matter of getting it into place and trimming it to fit. No need to glue. The door sills will keep it where you want it. I'm thrilled we were able to keep this bench seat. Cause short of the shifter, you can't get any closer to a stock look than this. One last thing. Pine, of course. And later on in the show, old blue hair's gonna leave the beauty shop. Thanks for staying with us. We're almost done with old blue hair back here, but there's something that I just gotta settle. Earlier in the show, you watched me create my own floor pan. Every time I use the bead roller to strengthen a piece of sheet metal, I get these emails saying that bead rolls are strictly cosmetic. Well, let's find out. I've got two pieces of 16 gauge sheet metal. One of them's rolled, one of them is not. Here we go, 40, 80, 120. 160. It's going. 200 pounds. Let's see what the rolled can do. Got it nice and square. 40, 80, buck 20, buck 60. 200, 240, 250. Oh, 255, 260. I think we've proven a very important point here. Bead rolled to this point is far superior than flat. Let's see how much more we can get. 20 more to make it 280. Here we go. Placement is everything. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, thing of beauty. Bead rolled is superior. Modern science. I love it. Now, I'm no Mr. Wizard, but at least now we've got an answer to that question. It's time to get back to work. Before we go any further, this new tunnel needs some corrosion prevention. I may apply some undercoating later, but for now, this'll do. This is literally the last new part that's going on our sleeper project. The drive shaft shop hooked us up with this three inch aluminum one piece unit, and it's pre-balanced. Now all that's left are some last minute details. There's gotta be at least a hundred puns I could say about what I'm doing right now to old blue hair. But I'm far more mature than that. Now the exhaust can go back on, including our street camo. Even though these parts are mostly new, it's better to be safe than sorry, so I'm going to lube up the whole front end. One of the most important decisions you'd make on any sleeper, more important than the drive line, is your wheel and tire combination, because they're a telltale sign of what you're packing. So I decided to go with this classic reproduction of the Corvette rally wheel from Coker Tires. My rubber selection was simple. Mickey Thompson came through with these 26 by 6 Sportsman SR radials for the front. The rear got a pair of these new ET Street radials coming in at 235 60R15s. Now I chose this wheel and tire combination for one simple reason. They accept junkyard hubcaps. These come from an 80 through 85 Malibu and they complete the package. Well, it's done. It's loaded with a new LS2 and a six speed. Could it be better? Sure it could. Could it have been done differently? Yes. But this sleeper was built like a lot of you guys would have done it, on a shoestring budget. We met our main goal. You'll never know what's under the hood till it's too late. It's cold and sloppy outside and I didn't build a toboggan. When it warms up, we'll take off old granny's sweater and strap on her helmet. But until then, I want you guys to email PowerBlockTV.com and tell me how you would test out old blue hair. Get away, move it. But for now, it's time to put Granny to bed. Until springtime. Later! Sounds pretty nice. Not bad. It'll be a lot better when we get done with it. Hey, welcome back. 
In case you think you got a case of deja vu suddenly, don't worry. This is indeed the 1970 Nova that Lou built up on the Muscle Car Show. You know, the one they called Project Blue Hair. Well, I got it. Excuse me a minute. I never liked that cartoon anyway. <laughs> Two words, Joe, anger management. Now you gotta love what Lou did to Granny's grocery getter to make it a true sleeper that could definitely give a wake up call to any hot rod who tried to pass it. The heart of the project is a GM Performance Parts LS2 crate engine. After dropping in the motor, Lou wired it up to a fast computerized controller, created a loop fuel system, beefed up the rear end with an Eaton Posi unit and 411 Richmond gears, added 28 spline carbon steel axles from Superior, then he threw out the monoleaf spring and fabbed up some Mopar style super stock springs. He bolted up a McLeod hydraulic clutch setup to complete the switch from automatic to a six speed and helped it hook up with some Mickey Thompson rubber around stock looking coker wheels. So what's it doing in here you might ask? Well, the answer lies back under the hood. The LS2 is a proven powerhouse with a horsepower rating of 440 at the flywheel. But is there ever enough? Since the introduction in 05, components have come along to give the LS2 a lot more power, plus the adjustability a lot of you like when it comes to things like controlling timing and fuel curve. Now, all these parts came right from the GM Performance Parts catalog, like CNC machined higher flowing heads, larger runner intake, and much beefier cam. Now, we're gonna try them out on the Nova today and see what we get on the Dino Jet a little bit later. Now you may recall the LS2 comes from the factory with a reluctor wheel that's controlled by a special electronic ignition that Lou installed on muscle car. We'll put that wheel to rest by using, get this, a small block Ford distributor from MSD, one of their 6AL ignition boxes, and a Blaster 3 coil. But first, we've got to tear the engine down, starting with the cooling system. That includes the shroud, the radiator, followed by the alternator, next the water pump, and the crank pulley. Then we can remove the ATI balancer, take off the front cover, pull the intake and carburetor off as one piece, and remove this valley cover. To remove the valve covers, disconnect the coil packs, pull the plug wires, and remove the bolts. With the packs out of the way, we can take off the valve covers. Next, the rockers are removed, then the push rods. We can loosen the headers, and then remove the cylinder heads. Now we pull the lifters, remove the oil pump, and timing chain, and finally the cam comes out. Ah, just made it. We're gonna try out a hot cam kit from GM Performance Parts in that LS2, and it consists of this hydraulic roller camshaft and 16 new springs that we've already installed in these heads. Now the camshaft specs out at 525 intake, 525 exhaust with 112 degrees of lobe separation. As a matter of comparison, this one I just took out specs out at 500 and 500. Now remember with a hydraulic roller, you lube it with motor oil only and be really careful not to nick the journals. You know, we've heard reports of some of you guys mentioning you gained up to 100 horsepower with this new hot cam setup. Well, we should be way ahead of that with the bigger heads and intake we're fixing to bolt on, not to mention a few of the extra parts. Welcome back to the Horsepower Shop. Today we're giving this 1970 Nova Sleeper a wake-up call with some serious bolt-ons from GM Performance Parts. Now in case you just joined us, it's got an LS2 crate engine that Lou installed over on the Muscle Car Show. It makes 440 horsepower at the flywheel, but that'll change when we get done with it. We just installed a new camshaft from the Hot Cam Kit, which also includes new valve springs. Now, these are necessary because the original springs 
are only good to 500 lift. These aluminum heads are designed after the C6R race heads and they flow within 10% of them. Now they come with solid stem valves that measure 216 on the intake, 159 on the exhaust side. While Joe installs those heads, let me show you the intake upgrade for our LS2. It's a GM racing design that takes no additional porting for maximum performance. It weighs in at only 10 pounds and it's specifically designed to fit the L76 L92 cylinder head. It's also been machined to accept any 4150 style carburetor. With the valley cover bolted back up and a Felpro gasket in place, the intake installs with supplied mounting bolts. Hey, before reinstalling the car, we're going to add this 2 inch billet spacer that will improve the air fuel mix into the manifold and the throttle response. Plus, with the car being off the intake a little bit like this, it'll also cool down the charge, give us a little bit more horsepower. For our mods, we spec'd out the 770 CFM Holly carburetor. Now it has center hung fuel bowls, vacuum secondaries, and an automatic electric choke. If you guys plan on doing this swap, keep in mind you will need some extra parts, like this rocker stand shaft and the actual rockers. Now there's one for the intake, a different one for the exhaust. Oh, and by the way, you'll also need different length push rods, but don't let all that scare you away because you can get all these pieces for right at 380 bucks. With the valve train finished, we can bolt up a new set of GM valve covers. With the oil pump bolted back up, it's time for another little interesting piece. This is a distributor drive fuel pump eccentric. This part drives the distributor, which we mount up front. This lobe is for the fuel pump, but we don't need it since we've got one that's electric. Anyway, here's how it installs. This part installs onto the cam sprocket. and Of course, make sure you use some Loctite on the bolts. Then the distributor drive part attaches to it with a long hex bolt. The next thing to go on is this new front distributor drive cover that comes with a built-in timing marker. For a damper, we got a hold of the guys at ATI and they sent us one of their steel super dampers. Now this thing is accepted in NHRA and IHRA and has an SFI spec rating of 18.1. First, we had to use one of the drill fixture kits to install a locator pin that will keep the balancer from spinning on the front of the crankshaft. Now we can bolt up this GM LS series water pump assembly, especially made for our setup with the front drive distributor. It's made by Wagner Automotive and it's the same one used by a lot of circle track racers. Our new water pump obviously moves everything forward, so we needed some new bracketry to move up all the accessories. Now Wagner Automotive helped us out with all this stuff too with some trick looking brackets, chrome alternator, tensioner, power steering pump, pulleys, belts, and all the correct length hardware to install it all. First, we'll bolt up the crank pulleys, followed by the power steering pump, now the alternator, then the water pump pulley, and we'll wrap it all up with the belts. Moving on to electronics, we're installing the MSD ignition box on the passenger side floorboard. Then using a bracket, we're bolting up the coil under the hood, and finally dropping in the distributor. You ready to hear this thing? What do you think? Oh yeah, here we go. Yeah, sounds pretty bad, but bad enough? No way. We're going to break it in real good, then bring it back in a few weeks, and you'll get to see what happens when we add a power adder to this LS2. Oh, I think we're getting ready to hear it with the cutouts open. Better hold your ears. <laughs> We're up to 180. I think we're good to make a run. All right. Hey, we're back in the horsepower shop, and uh, so is old Project Blue Hair. Now, you know this car. It's a 1970 Nova that we played with recently after our buddy Lou and Muscle Car gave it an LS2 crate motor. Of course, in here, more power is never enough. So we treated it to a hot cam kit, some CNC machined heads with larger intake runners, a racing design intake, topped by a Holley 770 car. Now to give it fire, we used an MSD small block Ford distributor, 6AL ignition box, and a blaster coil. From the factory, the LS2 is rated at 440 horsepower at the flywheel. That equals about 400 at the rear wheels of this Nova. Let's see how much we gain after that little horsepower hop up.
All right, not too bad. 435 horsepower at the rear tires. Well, that's definitely not enough. So today we're going to give old Blue Hair a little shot of Viagra. Now it's a cheater nitrous oxide system from NOS. It includes this bottle, nitrous and fuel solenoids, this injector plate, and the jets that'll give it up to a 250 horsepower shot. Now we also stepped up for some added options that we'll show you as we go. That NOS cheater is a wet nitrous system as opposed to a dry, and basically here's the difference. A dry system is primarily used in a fuel injected engine where the fuel and nitrous are delivered separately. Here, the vehicle's ECM regulates the amount of fuel going through the injectors. In a wet system, whether with a carburetor or EFI, the nitrous and fuel are injected through the spray bar at the same time. Of course, they make wet systems for both EFI and carbureted engines like the Nova here. Hey, thanks, pal. Look here, Mike already installed the bottle nut adapter and these brackets. Let's give this thing a home. This ought to be a good spot here since we have a grommet hole already in place to run our hose. Now remember, the valve knob needs to be pointed toward the front of the car. Now I can mark some holes for drilling. Then after bolting down the bottle, I can tighten up the bracket. The injector plate goes on next. That is, after we disconnect the throttle linkage, the fuel line, remove the carburetor, and remember this two inch spacer we installed earlier? Well, due to a lack of hood clearance, it has to go. Next, we remove the long carb studs and replace them with shorter ones from the kit. Then lay down a gasket, the injector plate with the NOS label facing up, another gasket, and finally the carb. Well, the solenoids are next. Notice how I just bolted this bracket up to our nitrous solenoid. So now I can install this filter fitting in the inlet port. Now make sure you use Teflon paste on these pipe fittings only and don't over tighten. Then we'll take this NPT compression fitting adapter and install it here on the outlet side. Now loosely mount the nitrous solenoid near the nitrous or blue end of the injector plate. Install the jet you want to start with, and we'll go with a 150 shot, followed by this extension tube. Now the fuel solenoid goes together the same way it mounts near the rear of the injector plate. So with the nitrous bottle mounted up and our solenoids installed, we're just a few steps away from spraying our way to more horsepower. How much? You'll have to hang with us to find out. Hey, welcome back to Horsepower, where old Blue Hair's getting a little shot of spray, and it ain't the kind for grooming. See, we're trying to get a little more power out of this LS2 that Lou shoved in this old Nova, and now that the nitrous and fuel solenoids are already on the motor, it's time to run our nitrous supply line starting at the bottle. Then we route it under the car, keeping it away from heat and, of course, moving parts. Now it's always a good idea to purge the line just to make sure there isn't any trash in it either from shipping or from when the line was assembled. Go ahead and open it up, Joe. Now the next step would be to attach it to the solenoid, but we've got a little option to add first. You bet, it's a purge valve kit and here's why it's a pretty good idea to have one. Liquid nitrous can turn into a gas in the supply line when it's exposed to heat. So you activate the system and for a brief time, there's only gas going into the engine and not as much power. Well, with the purge valve kit, you know there's plenty of liquid nitrous at the solenoid every time you press that button. We first install the purge adapter to the solenoid inlet, connect the nitrous feed line to the purge adapter nut, install the NPT adapter filter, then the purge solenoid goes onto the adapter fitting. Next, use the 90 degree MPT fitting to install the blowdown tubes to the outlet port. The LEDs attach to the ends of the tubes and if you're like us, you'll need longer tubes than those supplied in the kit. Since we've already got a high volume fuel system installed on the car, we don't need to run a separate pump for the nitrous. So what I did is I tapped into the main fuel line using a Dash 6 Union with an eighth inch to Dash 6 fitting. This will supply our fuel solenoid with enough fuel. Now the next step is to go ahead and install the activation switch on the car base using the supplied bracket from the kit. 
Wiring for the system basically goes like this. We've got ground wires from each solenoid bolted to the intake, two hot leads from each solenoid to the micro switch, and from the micro switch, this wire goes to a switched 12 volt source. For the purge solenoid wiring, we've got this wire we're using for a lead that's also bolted to the intake. This one goes to a switch inside the car, and we're also using it to activate the LEDs that light up the nitrous when you purge the system. Here inside the car, we found a great place to mount the arming switch for the nitrous system and the button for the purge. We started with the 150 horsepower jets and retarded the timing two degrees for each 50 horsepower entry. Finally, we worked our way up to the maximum 250 horse shot and the result, 666 horsepower at the rear wheel. Now, of course, you can't expect the same results with every engine. The results will vary according to your displacement and other modifications. Now, what's the price of this extra horsepower? Thought you'd never ask. About 500 bucks for the NOS cheater system, another 160 for that LED purge kit. There's only one thing wrong with the Nova. After the engine swap and all the work we actually did, the stock hood no longer clears. So we turned to Goodmark and they sent us this two inch cal all steel piece for a replacement. Old Blue Hair's not quite the sleeper she was before. And even with this little extra bit of attitude, nobody's ever gonna guess she's making this much power. Next up, we're headed to the ultimate cool car celebration at Road Atlanta. This thing fits great, even out of the box. Today we're looking back at Old Blue Hair. Now she's still sporting her original paint, which is really great for that sleeper look. But after horsepower got a hold of her, she's looking a little, well, confused. So Rick and Brent are gonna give her a facelift. Now I've had my fair share of facelifts. Staying out of this one. Hey, our project sleeper Nova here is still wearing the same original green paint that the general put on her back in 1970. For her age, she's holding up pretty good. This black hood, on the other hand, looks out of place. We've got to do something with it. But matching this original green paint is going to be pretty much impossible. So we're going to give the old girl a quickie and go over the whole thing. Now, I know to date on Muscle Car, every project we've shown you has been from bare metal up. But you know, sometimes it's just not in the budget. So as long as the original paint's not peeling or cracking and looks pretty good, you can paint right over it with the proper prep. We're going to show you how to do just that. It all starts with removing the essentials like the bumpers, trim, and door handles. You could mask these off and still get pretty good results, but a little extra time here will really pay off in the end. Just make sure to label everything and don't lose any parts. Now we were going to leave the side trim on here until we actually took it off and came to the realization this stuff looks lame. So what we're going to do, shave off the side trim here and fill in these holes. I'll cut these studs off first, then come back and smooth them off with a grinder. Make sure to remove the paint from in and around the holes so your welds don't get contaminated. And weld slowly so you don't overheat the panel. There's a couple of small areas of rust around the wheels that need to be taken care of. Most guys would fill it in with fiberglass filler, but I'm going to cut it out and weld some metal in. Brent's making a patch out of sheet metal. This 18 gauge steel will closely match the Nova's existing panels. It's easy with a shear and a break, but you could make it with tin snips and a vise too. Well, once the outer panel was cut away, well, we realized rust went a little deeper than expected, so another patch had to be made. Some weld through primer will seal the exposed metal on our inner patch. Now don't run a continuous bead. This is one time when it's good to be tacky. Space out the weld so you won't warp the snot out of it. 
Now the old girl here, she's got a few dents and dings and bruises, just like any car is going to pick up over the years. And I'm not pointing any fingers, but somewhere between horsepower and muscle car, she managed to pick up an extra dent back here. This one's a little bit bigger than the other ones that we've been dealing with, so it's going to require a stud gun to pull it out. But before we can do that, we got to get started with a mallet. Small dings like this one on the fender can be pulled out. Once the area is stripped to metal, a stud is welded to the surface using a specially designed gun. Use it to pull out the dent, then grind the stud off. A hammer and dolly will correct the high and low spots left behind. Next, feather the edges of the repair. Lay on a thin coat of body filler and sand it until the contours are just right. They call it bodywork for a reason. It's work, but that's what it takes to smooth out the wrinkles she's gotten over the years. We're lucky that our Nova is a low mileage survivor, so the repair work is minimal. All right, guys, I'm going to fill you in on one of my little secrets here. Now, every body guy I've ever met has never heard of this, but once he tries it, he'll use it for the rest of his life. I call it stink rock. The correct name for it is actually grill brick, and it was invented for the restaurant industry. It's used for uh, cleaning grills and stovetops and that type of thing. Why do I call it stink rock? Because when you use this stuff, it smells like the porta potty at your local construction site. As you sand with it, the face conforms to the shape of the panel, so you can get those compound curves perfect. Well, Rick's getting his stink on. I'm going to be stripping this rear panel. This cleaning disc will take off all the old paint and sealer without hurting the metal. Once the paint and sealer are stripped off, you may need to come back with a portable sandblaster to get the remaining rust off. Now, we are just about done with the prep work on our Project Sleeper Nova. Next week, we're going to roll her into the booth and get some primer and paint put on her. Now, we've gotten a lot of emails from you guys about Project Overkill. So we're going to show you everything we've done to our 70 Challenger, all next time on Muscle Car. We've been taking a look back at a project that I've got a ton of time in. Now it's Rick's turn. Hey, what do you got over there? Well, Lou, we all know that you are definitely no body guy, but that's all right. Brent and I've got this one covered. Our sleeper Nova here was looking pretty tired, so we're giving the old girl a facelift. Now, I know not every guy out there has $10,000 in his budget for a top-end paint job. It's not that big of a deal. What we're doing here is showing the average guy how he can get it done for a whole lot less. Last week, we pulled all the trim, knocked out some dents, took care of some rust spots, and spent a lot of time smoothing out all of her imperfections. There's still more sanding to be done. Now I could spend weeks blocking and sanding a car. But dude, this is no show car, so we got to keep it simple. But you also have to keep in mind, the more time you spend with this in your hand, the better your paint job is going to look. Once our blocking was done, we used a DA sander with 180 grit. The lacquer would jam up a finer grit paper, and a coarser grit would leave deep scratches that would have to be smoothed out. Just be careful here not to dig into the surface with the edge of the disc. Okay, now this is the point where most of you guys are probably going to have to turn it over to a paint shop. If you've done your prep work correctly, even an inexpensive place will give you great results. Just make sure that they use good materials and you get a warranty. If you're lucky enough to have access to a spray booth, now is the time to roll it in. Whatever you do, don't try to paint this at your house. The chemicals and materials used are not only bad for the environment, they'll use your lungs as punching bags. One of the problems with painting over original lacquer is that the solvents in your new paint can attack it, and it could soften it, which will cause wrinkling and peeling and that type of thing. That's why we're using the Rusty Fender. This is a zero VOC primer, so there's no solvents in it that's going to attack our original finish. Plus, it'll give us a nice even hue to apply our solvent-based urethanes on top of. This is my first time using this primer, and I've noticed something. It's pretty transparent for a high build primer, so don't be surprised if you can still see through the first coat. Three are actually required for full coverage. 
We're using a guide coat to show high and low spots. There's a lot of different types out there, but we're using powder. A rub down with a long block and 180 grit comes next. If we weren't on a budget, a urethane primer would smooth out the texture left from the blocking. But to save money, we're skipping it. This paint will last for 10 or 15 years, no sweat. But it's no high-end paint job either. Now rather than drop into the 300 bucks into priming and reblocking, we're going to paint right over our first layer of primer. But before we can do that, we need to wet sand it with 400 grit to smooth out the scratches left from the 180 block. Wet sanding can make a big mess, but there's really just no way around it. We'll worry about the floor later, but the car needs a wash now. Make sure to use a soap that doesn't have any sealers or wax in it, just pure soap. Aw, oh, old blue hair's getting a sponge bath. <laughs> That's good! <laughs> Now the good thing about washing the car down like this, other than the fact that I got to get Brent wet, is that you can look down the side of it and see how straight your bodywork is. On a job like this, a painter can spend more time masking than actually painting. I'm using a foam tape to mask this door jam. It's faster, but it is a lot more expensive. Brent, on the other hand, is using masking tape. It takes longer, but it's a whole lot cheaper. Either way, it'll get the job done. Think of your sealer as an insurance policy. Since we're painting over mismatched materials, lacquer, bondo, bare metal, and high build primer, the sealer will create a barrier that locks everything down, and it gives a uniform surface for the paint. Old Blue Hair is keeping her original color, an age-appropriate shade of aqua green metallic with a paint to reducer ratio of one to one. Build the color up slowly with 50% overlap, this will prevent the tiger striping you can get when you spray it on too heavy. If you spray it on too light, you'll get modeling. Lay down your base until you have good coverage. Now this could be anywhere from one to eight coats depending on the color. Let it flash or dry until it's dull to allow your solvents to evaporate between coats. A final dust coat will make sure that the metallic is even. Three coats of high solid clear will protect that fresh color and give it plenty of shine. Final step, reassembly. Now this is where the organization you did taking it apart will really pay off. The paint is still soft and it won't be fully cured for about 60 or 90 days, so you gotta be careful. During that time, you can wash it, but again, don't use anything with sealers or wax. And don't throw a car cover on it, this thing needs to breathe. Well, our operation was a success. It's amazing what a facelift can do. Now the key to making a low budget paint job like this work great is taking your time on the prep. At a shop, time is money. So even if you send it out for paint, the more prep you do yourself, the more green you're gonna keep in your pocket. Hey Lou, what do you think? She's looking 30 years younger. That Nova's so hot, I think I'm gonna take her out, take her for a night on the town, buy her a bottle of Octane Booster, and see what happens later. <laughs>